still be a carrier. So just because someone doesn't look like them sick doesn't mean that you couldn't get something from them. So you want to make sure that you're using good hand hygiene, uh, washing your hands whenever you need to, that you're using your PPE, and that you're being really careful when you are around sharks. So you could get a blood borne pathogen doing any of these things, obviously administering first aid or cleaning up after any kind of an accident. Um, cleaning a restroom because there's a high probability that there could be bodily fluids or bloods in that kind of an area. And then using anything that's covered in dried or wet blood because there are diseases that can live outside of the body. And the people who are most at risk are people like first responders and law enforcement, lab personnel, housekeeping and facilities personnel, and then obviously nurses and doctors and other people who work in healthcare. So we've got two modes of transmission. There's direct transmission where you're coming into direct physical contact with a sick person. So touching an infected individual, sexual contact, and then contact with oral secretions or any cuts that someone might have on themselves. Then you've got indirect contact where you're coming into contact with a contaminated surface. So someone cuts themselves and gets blood on the door to the bathroom. Anyone who comes in afterwards and touches that, if it hasn't been cleaned up, has now been exposed. Even though you haven't touched the person, you've touched the, the blood or fluids or whatever. It's always important to be aware of ways that you can be exposed when you're doing your job. Um, in this kind of an atmosphere, most of you guys would only come into contact with this stuff if there was some sort of an accident. It's not really something that you guys are working with on a daily basis. So you need to make sure that you're aware of what you should do if there is an accident so that you can protect yourself. Um, normal unbroken skin is a really good barrier. If you get a drop of blood on you and you don't have any cuts or anything, you haven't automatically been exposed. You've been contaminated, but you haven't been exposed. Now, if you've got acne or blisters or a cut or anything, and the blood gets on that, then yeah, you've been exposed. So you can be exposed from blood to blood contact, blood and OP and IM contact with any cuts that you've got, obviously being um, poked by a contaminated shark, and then blood and OP and IM contact with your eyes or your mucous membranes. You cannot be exposed from mosquitoes, air or water, tears, sweat or urine, and then saliva as long as there's no blood in that saliva. So now I'll talk about those three diseases that I mentioned earlier. Um, Hep B is an infection of the liver. It can cause scarring, liver failure, and liver cancer, and is potentially life-threatening. This one is usually a short-term infection, but five to 10% of adults and kids older than five who get Hep B end up with a long-term infection. There is a vaccination available. If you're a student here, you have to have your Hep B vaccine, and it works really well. If you haven't been vaccinated and you think that you've been exposed, you can get the vaccine within 24 hours and it still works. There are, um, there are as many as 1.4 million people in the U.S. who are carriers of Hep B, but infection rates have dropped a lot since that vaccination was developed. And Hep B can survive for at least a week in dry blood, so this will be a really big one for indirect transmission. And you've got symptoms like jaundice, fever, fatigue, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And those can start 60 to 150 days after you've been exposed. The average is about 90 days, but there are some people who don't develop any symptoms at all. They're still carriers and they can still get other people sick. And you've got Hep C, which is also a liver disease. This one affects 2.7 to 3.9 million people in the US. And this one can also be short-term or long-term, but 75 to 85% of people who get it end up with a long-term infection. So a big difference between Hep B and Hep C. Hep B is usually short-term, Hep C is usually long-term. And this one can live up to three weeks outside of the body, but only under specific conditions. So it's gotta be room temperature, and it has to be on some sort of a clinical or household surface, like a sink or a door handle or something like that. We've got symptoms that are similar to Hep B, with fever, fatigue, abdominal pain, nausea, loss of appetite, weight loss, and jaundice. The average time from exposure to symptoms showing for this one is two to 12 weeks. However, most people don't develop symptoms for Hep C. So not just some people, most people don't. There's not a vaccination available for this one, but there is a long-term treatment course that you can take that is 80 to 90% effective at curing it. And then you've got HIV, which is your virus that leads to AIDS. About half the people who get HIV develop AIDS within 10 years. And this one, almost 40,000 people were diagnosed in the US in 2017, and there are about 1.1 million people total who are living with HIV. And it depletes your immune system by destroying blood cells that help the body fight diseases. This one really doesn't survive well outside of the body. If it is outside the body, it's gonna last less than 24 hours and it's gonna be in very, very small amounts, but the disease is so bad that you still wanna take all your necessary precautions because you do not want it to get it. And you've got symptoms like fever, diarrhea, headaches, fatigue, nausea, and weight loss, and they can develop two to four weeks after you've been exposed. They can last a few days or they can last several weeks. And again, just like the other ones, some people don't develop symptoms, but they're still a carrier and they can still get other people sick. 
and it's not a cure for HIV, but it can, and it can be fatal, but with proper medical care, it can be controlled. So what's your chance of getting any of these diseases after an occupational exposure, which is gonna be something like you get poked with a sharp or you get a splash of blood onto a cut. So hep B, as I mentioned, the vaccine works really well. So if you've been vaccinated, you aren't at much of a risk. If you haven't been vaccinated and you're exposed, you've got a six to 30% chance of getting it. For hep C, you've got a 1.8% chance and then HIV is 0.3%. And those are not the only three diseases that are covered by the standard. There's a whole big list if you really wanted to, you could go look it up. Um, but those are just the three that we talk about because those are the really bad ones. So your employer responsibilities. OSHA um, requires that anyone whose job requires exposure to a bloodborne pathogen has to be training. Your initial training has to be in person. It can't be done online and your training is required annually. And then anyone whose job requires exposure is offered any vaccines, doctor's visits, and treatments at no cost to you guys, and then your PPE is offered at no cost to you. Um, something that if any of you are working in a department now or maybe in the future where you are expected to come into contact with bloodborne pathogen uh, material as part of your job, you'll have to have an exposure control plan. It should be in your department. It's basically all the paperwork for how you should be doing your job, how you should be working around the bloodborne pathogens. Um, so any special rules that you might have, it's going to have any paperwork you might need if there was an accidental exposure, what you would need to fill out. It's going to let you know what you need to do. So if there ever is a chance that you know, you're working in an area where this is part of your job, make sure you know where that is so that you can get to it if you need to. So now we'll talk about exposure prevention. Um, we've got engineering controls, which put some sort of a barrier between you and the hazard. In your case, that's probably going to be things like sharks containers or maybe biohazard trash cans. If you were in a lab setting, it would be something like a fume hood. It just puts some sort of a physical barrier or distance between you and whatever the hazard is. They work really well as long as they're properly maintained. So as long as someone hasn't dropped a sharps container and it's cracked and leaking, then it should be doing its job and it should work just fine. And then we've got administrative or workplace controls, which are the rules for how you're doing your job. Um, some of the things that the standard requires is you shouldn't be eating or drinking, putting on makeup or smoking around blood or OPIM. You don't want to store food or drinks in a refrigerator where you might have blood samples or stuff like that in it. Um, you should always have access to hand washing facilities and there should be rules about when you should be using your PPE, all of that kind of stuff. And then your last line of defense between you and the hazard is your personal protective equipment. Um, you have to use PPE if your exposure or your engineering controls and then your work practice controls don't eliminate the hazard 100%, which most of the time they don't. Um, in your guys' cases, I imagine that most of your PPE would just be gloves because you aren't expected to come into contact with bloodborne pathogen stuff very often. So make sure that you've got access to gloves if there was an accident and you needed them for something. Um, your employer has to provide your PPE at no cost to you guys, and it has to be appropriate. It has to protect you from whatever the hazard is that you're dealing with. So if you have gloves, but they've got holes in them, that's not going to work. So always make sure that whatever you have is actually going to protect you like it needs to. Um, make sure that you're wearing the right types of gloves for whatever hazard it is that you're going to be dealing with. Replace your gloves as soon as possible if they get torn or really contaminated or if you're dealing in a situation where you've got multiple patients. Obviously change your gloves between each patient. Um, never reuse disposable gloves and always wash your hands after removing contaminated gloves because it's super easy when you're taking your gloves off to maybe get something up on your wrist. So you always want to be careful and wash your hands after you take gloves off. Um, and try and protect your face and your eyes because there's a chance that whatever you're doing is going to cause stuff to splash up onto your face. Biohazard labels. I'm sure you guys have probably seen these before. They should be on things like your waist, sharks containers, anything that's got blood or biohazardous substance in it. This is going to let you know, hey, you need to be careful whenever you're handling this. It's got to be a nice fluorescent orange or bright orange red color. It has to have that symbol and it has to say the word biohazard on it. And it should be as close to or directly on whatever it is that contains the biohazardous substance. Usually it's printed onto the container, like sharps containers is printed on the label, um, or it's a sticker that you can just put right onto something. Um, whenever you're ready to dispose of anything that has a biohazardous substance on it, make sure that you're putting it in an appropriate container. Um, you don't want to throw bloody gloves into your regular trash can because then any housekeeping personnel or maybe there's a student out there that comes in they could possibly be exposed to whatever you throw in the trash can because they don't know that there's blood or whatever in there. If you're ever in a situation where you've got some blood or anything that you need help cleaning up, you can get a hold of EHS and we can come help you with that because I know, at least in this environment, you guys don't have biohazard trash cans just hanging out everywhere. 
So if you ever had a situation where you did need something like that, you can get a hold of us, we can come help you out. If you ever did need to clean up stuff, um, wear your PPE, so just put gloves on. Always put gloves on if you're dealing with any sort of blood or bodily fluids. Um, we recommend that you cover the solo paper towels or a rag so that when you go to pour a cleaning solution on it, it's not splashing up and making more of a mess than it already has. And then you want to let your stuff set on it for at least 10 minutes or whatever the manufacturer recommends. And then you can just clean it up like a normal spill, but make sure all of that and your PPE goes into a biohazard trash can. Even though it's been cleaned up with bleach or whatever, you still don't want to throw all of that in your regular trash. And depending on the situation, if there's some equipment that gets blood on it and you can't clean it up immediately, you want to make sure that you put some sort of a sign on there. That way if someone came up to try and use it, they knew that they needed to clean that before they used the equipment. So what happens after you think you've been exposed? You want to wash the area with soap and water and then report to your supervisor immediately. Obviously, if it's some sort of an emergency situation, go to the doctor, take care of all of that first, and then let your supervisor know as soon as you can afterwards. We're going to document what happened, maybe look for a root cause, see if you can put some rules in place so it doesn't happen again. You'll get a doctor's visit. If you consent, they'll draw your blood, run some tests, make sure that everything looks okay. If there's a source individual, like you got poked with a shark, we'll try and figure out who that shark was used on first. They'll draw their blood, run tests, and you'll get those results so then you'll know that you have been exposed to anything. Um, if there are any extra doctor's visits or treatments or anything like that that you need, then it's still, it's all covered at no cost to you. Um, and this is something I like to go over just because there's always a chance that there could be an accident and might have to help out. So number one rule of first aid is if they can self-administer, let them do it. So if you can just hand somebody a band-aid and that's it, that's great. If you have to get in there and actually help, then always find gloves. Be aware of any cuts or blisters or just broken skin that you might have. Try and cover that up so that if something splashed, you wouldn't have to worry about exposure. Um, if you do end up with blood or OPIM on yourself, immediately wash the area with soap and water. And if you get it in your eyes, your nose, or your mouth, then you want to flush the area with running water for at least 15 minutes. So what should you take away? Bloodborne pathogen rules are in place for your health and safety. Failure to follow these rules is an unnecessary risk that shouldn't be taken and better safe than sorry. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. If you've signed